Hello everyone, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this discussion that NAPCAN has put on in support of Anti-Poverty Week 2022. I hope you're having a good afternoon uh, and I really appreciate you sharing your time with us and joining us. My name is Rani Kumar. I'm the recently appointed uh, Deputy CEO at NAPCAN. It's uh, funny to say that out loud, really. It's very, been very recent. Um, I've been given the responsibility today to guide you through a very important conversation about poverty and inequality and how this relates to child abuse and neglect, both in terms of prevention and response. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the lands from which I'm joining you today. I'm in Sydney. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to acknowledge all of the elders past, present and emerging from the lands from which you may be watching today and to welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who've logged on. Um, just a quick bit of housekeeping, if you're not familiar with GoToWebinars, the platform we're using today, the control panel is on the right hand side of your screen. If you run into any technical issues, please contact our team, their details are in the chat function that you'll see. Um, and you know, they're really happy to help you out, they're very skilled. If um, you also look in that control panel area, you'll see a questions tab. Uh, we've got hundreds of people online today, which is great, but we'd love to hear from you. We want this to be an interactive discussion. We want to know what your questions are, what you'd like to know more about. So please keep sending your questions through uh, throughout this webinar today. Relevant handouts and links will also be pasted into that chat function. If someone mentions a report or something you'd like a copy of, um, send us a note and we'll try and see if we can track it for you. Um, and of course, the webinar is recorded and will be uh, posted to our website and emailed to anyone who's been registered in due course, probably in about a week's time. So a little about Anti-Poverty Week. Well, it's on this week from the 16th to the 22nd of October, and it's celebrating its 20th year of acting on poverty. This year's campaign asks us all to make sure that Australian children and families can cover the basics and have a secure roof over their head. Children can thr thrive and be healthy when they have what they need to develop well. This Anti-Poverty Week, we, in conjunction with all the partners supporting Anti-Poverty Week, are calling on all our parliamentarians to commit to halve child poverty by 2030. This means that Australia can meet our international commitments to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and the UN Global Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals. So to help us all um, urge parliamentarians to legislate to halve child poverty by 2030 with measurable targets and actions to achieve this goal, you can go to the Anti-Poverty Week website after you've watched this webinar um, and download the Half Child Poverty Pledge, which we're putting a link to in our chat as well. Um, you put your name in, you hold it up and take a photo and you share it on social media as well as with the Anti-Poverty Week team and um, join uh, that big call to parliamentarians to halve child poverty. And clearly that message that Anti-Poverty Week has is about, um, it is, you know, aligns very closely with NAPCAN's, um, you know, mission and what we're always asking for, which is for every child in every community to have a fair go. In particular, we want children growing up uh, safe, supported and connected in their family, community and culture. But we know not, not all children are growing up safe and supported and that child protection systems are overloaded. We want to utilise every single opportunity we have to change the trajectory for these children. We can stop child abuse and neglect. We can reduce its impact. We can address poverty and end it. Um, and sometimes these sound like motherhood statements, like, oh, these lofty goals, how are we ever going to get there? But we know there are actions that can make a difference. And that is what today's conversation is about. It's about how we can use research and practice wisdom to help understand what poverty, first of all, has to do with child abuse and neglect. Obviously, nobody is suggesting that people living in poverty or communities with lower income abuse their children more, but children from these areas are more likely to be in the child protection system and children end up in out of home care, more from areas where there's low socioeconomic um, income. So we know this is particularly true for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children as well. So what's the story here? That's what we're here to unpack. What are those factors around the family, the things happening in the community and our broader Australian society that are increasing the chances of these children and young people ending up in contact with the child protection system and with overall poorer outcomes across a range of health, education and wellbeing measures? This is not okay. If we want to make sure every child in every community can have a fair go, we need to make sure that there aren't 
774,000 children or one in six Australian children aged under 14 living in poverty. A very high proportion of children experiencing poverty are living in families who rely on government payments. Permanently increasing those payments, family payments, job seeker, single parent payments, will reduce poverty. And we should be asking for that. However, multiple studies have also found that poverty isn't just about income. A lack of money limits children and young people's lives and their learning and seeps into other aspects of their lives. Not having a secure home is a significant stress when living on a low income. The Everybody's Home campaign is looking for a large investment in social housing by federal and state and territory governments to address the crisis in housing affordability that's facing too many individuals and families and really impacting on the wellbeing of children in Australia. This would also assist women and children who are needing to flee domestic violence, which we know is at a crisis point too. We know these issues are current and vitally important, especially in light of the economic circumstances and the cost of living rises. Um, the Keeping Kids Safe and Well Your Voices report, which was led and drafted by the National Children's Commissioner, Anne Hollands, um, it, and it was only just released earlier this year, showed that the top three things that children, young people and families, and it's particularly startling that children, young people are saying these things, said that they need to feel safe are help with housing, help with accessing mental health services, and help with basic needs like food, clothing, transport and school supplies, which are obviously closely related to income. Professor Sharon Bessel from the Children's Policy Centre at ANU has done years of research with children about their experiences of poverty and will share a short video at the end of this webinar which really shares the voices of the children directly to you. Um, so as you can hear, there are many intersecting threads to this story. There's income, there's housing, there's access to opportunities, um, social exclusion, and then there's the intergenerational impacts through lower completion rates, et cetera, that we often see for children who grew up um, in more um, deprived areas, which is why we brought together today these fabulous experts who can illuminate these key issues and crucially, tell us some ways forward. So just before I introduce our fantastic um, presenters today and get into the discussion, I do want to note that some of the content we cover in the session may be sensitive or a bit difficult or upsetting for some of you. Please look out for yourself and remember it's okay to switch off or step away from the webinar if you need to. You can always come back and join in whenever you want to. We won't know you've stepped away. It's um, best to take care of yourself. We've also posted some contact details of services and helplines um, that are available for support if you need it. Um, so we have with us today Professor Bridget Featherstone from the UK. She's from the Uni of Huddersfield where she's the Professor of Social Work and a globally recognised expert on this topic. She was a member of the very influential Child Welfare Inequalities Project which concluded in 2017 so she can give us a bit of a sense of what's happened since then as well. Um, we also have with us Professor Ilan Katz from the University of New South Wales from the Social Policy Research Centre there. Um, Ilan started his career as a social worker but is now a renowned expert on policy and research in the child and family space. Um, and we've got Claudia Lennon from the Benevolent Society, who's the Director of Practice and Impact Management. And she's also a qualified social worker with many years of experience um, in not-for-profit and uh, government agencies, and has a lot of expertise in um, working with children and families that she will be able to share with us. So now I'd like to invite um, Bridge um, Featherstone to kick off the discussion with a bit of a summary um, address, which will cover the key learnings from her work in this area in the UK, um, after which I'll invite Ilan and Claudia back on to share their perspectives, and then we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. Please uh, keep sending your questions through. Thanks, and over to you, Bridge. Hello, everyone. Um, this feels very strange. I'm, I'm in the north of England and it's four o'clock in the morning here, very dark out my window. Uh, thank you, Ronnie, for that uh, very helpful um, introduction and indeed for the conversations we've had that have helped me to um, structure what I'm going to try and say to you today. So what I'd like to talk to you first about is the Child Welfare Inequalities Project, which as Ronnie mentioned, officially finished in 2017, but actually has gone on in various forms since uh, with different bits of activity and certainly with a huge impact drive. So what was it and what did we do? Uh, it was 
a four nation project, i.e. we covered Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland and it was funded by the Nuffield Foundation and it was led by uh, Professor Paul Bywaters uh, who works with me here now at the University of Huddersfield and who has a background in health inequalities which actually was very important in terms of the thinking uh, of the project. We did um, um, mixed methods or integrated methods, I think we decided we called it in the end, uh, where we uh, did a large quantitative study uh, looking at the statistics across the four nations and then we did it um, and of course quantitative work tells us what's going on but qualitative work tells us much more about why it's going on so we did uh, case studies in Scotland, England and uh, laterally in Northern Ireland. Um, what, what was our research question? We were trying to understand the relationship between deprivation and a child's chances of becoming involved with the child protection system. So it was about not about what happens in families, it was about interactions with our services. Crucially, we looked at two measures. One was, uh, in England, we call them child protection plans, which is a signal that there is need for more intensive help than perhaps maybe at a child in need place pay a stage in Scotland it's called child protection registration. So we looked at that, uh, the numbers of children on that, and we also looked at children in looked at, who became looked after, who came into out of home care. And the headlines are that we found a very clear in every country, there were differences between the countries and you might want to ask me about them because uh, they raised some interesting issues possibly about inequality actually, um, but uh, we found in every country there was a clear association between uh, what we what's called area level deprivation and i'll explain that a little bit more in a minute and the child's chances of coming into care so the headline figure uh, which is still quoted i noticed it was on twitter this morning is that a child in blackpool which is um maybe some of you may have visited uh, a very very uh, poverty stricken uh, part of uh, the uk um big seaside town very uh, yeah, uh, that it, a child there was over 10 times more likely to come into care than a child in a very affluent uh, part of London. Uh, we found, why did we use this measure, area level deprivation? Well, we found um, that across the four nations of the UK, none of the governments uh, gather what's called parent level data. They don't, so for example, when children are taken into care by our services, no data is collected on whether their parents are in work, whether they're subject to benefits. So there, we don't know why, whether our recent cost of living crisis, which is really extreme, or the welfare project that has been uh, resulted in a great deal of reforms. We don't know how that's impacted upon parents. We can't track that uh, in the child protection system. We know it more broadly but we don't know it in relation to the child protection system and we had to use area level deprivation as a proxy measure. I mean it's a reliable established one but it had obviously it would have been better to have parent level deprivation. So that, that seemed to us to give a very clear message about the invisibility of the relationship between poverty and child protection of which I'll come back to. Second thing is that we found uh, not only was there this clear association as I say between the poorest and um, their chances, but there was what we call in health inequalities literature a, a social gradient, i.e. every, it's like a ladder, every step increase in deprivation increased the chances of a child coming into care. So it's not a simple distinction as the, the government we currently have has, and its predecessors uh, have been saying for the last 2010, they've been saying really it's a kind of gap between the poor, the feckless, the troubled, and the rest of us and uh, they've been trying to draw this binary distinction between um, people who get into trouble and the rest of us who are all living these blameless lives and we found that that was absolutely not the case so which is why we're so worried about the cost of living crisis now because increasing deprivation does increase uh, rates of children coming into care. Uh, it doesn't always but it does uh, usually and I'll come back to that again in tariff we have time in terms of the influence that practice models can have. We found an interesting uh, finding in relation to inequality and the possible uh, kind of uh, consequences of inequality, which is that if you were a poor child in an affluent area, you're more likely to come into care than if you were a poor child in a poor area. 
and what we we don't there is some research being done on inequality worldwide uh, but in our case we couldn't we can't our data doesn't allow us to unravel whether it's about the stress of being poor in an affluent area which the inequalities literature would help would direct us towards or whether it is that local authorities in affluent areas have more resources which has definitely been the case in the UK the spending cuts have fallen disproportionately on the poorest local authorities um, so in terms of the quants data, uh, data, it was a real challenge to the individualised focus of our practice, which is about what happens in the household and is completely focused on what parents do or don't do, acts of commission or omission. In the qualitative data, we found that, um, well, a key message was that actually poverty was everyday reality of people. Of social workers practice. They went out to the same places every day, the same estates, the same streets, uh, and it was unremarkable though and unremarked upon. The only time that people would say to us um, would, when we were observing, because we did quite a lot of observing as well as interviews, the only time it would be raised is, is when people were visiting an affluent family and they would suddenly start saying, well, you know, do I look all right? Should I talk to legal? Uh, Claudia Bernard here has done some more work on, on uh, working with affluent families if you're interested and I can send that um, uh, that research. So we called it the wallpaper of practice, unremarkable and unremarked upon. We also found that it was quite clear from the interviews uh, that whilst people could articulate in a general abstract sense uh, the, the understanding that poverty is bad for for all of us and that it has real stresses for families. We actually found a very clear message was from the social workers. It's not our core business though. Our core business is assessing parenting and assess assessing risk capacity. And the responses that were developed in, in, in response to that uh, understanding were to send people on parenting programs. Um, there was not a recognition that perhaps it might be hard to uh, concentrate on a parenting program if you were worried about paying your bills or you were indeed hungry or you were worried about the landlord evicting you. Um, again, we'll come back to the issue about uh, about um, housing in a minute because I know it's a big issue as Ronnie said in the state and Australia it's really a big issue here as well. So um, since then I mean there's lots more I could talk about we did a very interesting follow-on work in, no in Northern Ireland to understand why their rates are quite low the association with poverty holds but they actually have quite rates of children in care and what's that about and is it linked to uh, issues around uh, family support and community cohesion which you may want me to talk about. Since then we've engaged, uh, we had a very strong focus all through the research on impact and actually that was my job, I was the impact lead. Uh, so impact was picked, built into the project right from the start. We wanted to change the conversation uh, as we, as we uh, developed our research and we wanted to intervene at every level. So we've done loads and loads of training with workers, we've done lots of discussions with uh, policymakers in different parts of the UK with some success. Uh, more than in others. Uh, English government, surprise, surprise, isn't that receptive to our um, work. Although, to be fair, uh, a recent review that they funded, but said was independent, has used our work quite a lot. That's to be fair. So I just want to tra track some of the um, debates we've been having, which actually Rani very helpfully highlighted. Um, First of all, uh, at the beginning, particularly 2017-18, it has changed, the conversation has changed. But at the beginning we were getting this, you know, I'm really insulted by your presentation, you're pathologising poor people, I grew up in poverty, that was from often from social workers, from people who are active on child poverty, like the Child Poverty Action Group, who we now do, we've done a lot of work with since, but initially a real anxiety from them that, um, you know, black, uh, poor people are pathologised and shamed enough and don't throw child, uh, child protection into the mix, you'll really, really um, pathologise them even more. So we had a lot of work to do to um, engage with um, what turned out to be quite complicated but important debates about the difference between systemic and direct causation. So uh, what we were trying to say was, you know, very, virtually no, no social problem in our society has one cause. There is usually a multiplicity of causes. And what we are trying to say is that poverty is a really important, uh, what I think the phrase we often have used is contributory causal factor. 
It's not the only one, but it's a contributory causal factor and we have been neglecting it. We have been focusing on other things and we've also neglected its relationship to substance misuse, its relationship to domestic abuse, its relationship to mental health problems. And, they, and, they, and so we've been drawing people's attention to a wider literature, a health inequalities literature. Incidentally, one of the things we've discovered about our debates and discourses is they have been very insular. It's been a bit of a group thing. We had we use the same literature all the time to reinforce uh, each other's positions. So we've been bringing in other literature deliberately, particularly the health inequalities literature. And um, we were told we were excusing bad behaviour. Again, we tried to explain the difference between understanding and excusing. And I think one of the things, though, for my own profession, which is that one of social work, is it exposed. And I feel a bit ashamed about this and have been doing quite a lot of work since this discovery, it exposed uh, out the way in which neoliberal ideas about responsabilization had really come into the profession, which is ironic because we're often dismissed um, by governments in this country, in our country, in England, um, as you know, liberal lefties and wishy washies. Actually, we found quite authoritarian uh, attitudes, you know, that people were making choices to uh, behave badly, to go off a dangerous men to drink too much, they were making these rational choices. Uh, and so we were, yeah, so there was quite a lot, despite the rhetoric about social work as being anti-oppressive and social justice, actually we found neoliberal discourses were quite powerful. I'm just going to move my, yeah. Well, the other last message from the qualitative work, and it's a broad message which is very, very echoed in a big literature, is that genuinely, uh, when the penny dropped and people were trying to understand how they could have better conversations and we've done a lot of work on that and the issue of shame became a real issue how how do you engage with shame and uh, and how do you and how crucially this has been a bit easier how do, how do you make sure that your services are not reproducing shame and this is um, an example i give a lot of the, a lot of times but it's actually a very powerful example and kind of highlights uh, some of the ways in which our systems can compound shape. We observed a meeting where uh, a man had said before the meeting, the father, he really did need his bus fares home because he had spent all his money on getting into town. And until recently, our bus fares have been incredibly expensive, particularly in rural England, and they haven't been subsidised. It's changing a little at the minute. Anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, the decision of the meeting, or recommendation rather, not decision, because it was a decision for the courts, but the recommendation was that his child would be uh, removed permanently and be uh, recommended for adoption. Massively, horrendously um, painful. Uh, and he was obviously very upset afterwards. And he had to go around to virtually everyone in the room looking to see who could give him his bus fares home. And so we asked, we've been asking people to think about their processes when they have meetings, uh, do they provide food? Do they uh, make sure that meetings are timetabled in such a way that people can get to them easily? Uh, and now we're actually saying, are you really taking into account people's work circumstances and commitments uh, in a, such a precarious world? Um, the conversations within our profession and more generally within uh, kind of like management and to some extent in bits of the government has changed. And the game changers have been, I mean, uh, you know, I think that Paul and the team uh, we did a really important job around because we were so committed to impact. So I would claim a little bit of credit for that. Also, the evidence has got much stronger. We were voices in the wilderness slightly at the beginning, um, but you know, Paul has just uh, published with other colleagues a really important um, evidence review, which has, uh, looks at the evidence from across um, the English-speaking world. And there's some really robust studies from the States now that show us that income really does matter, both reductions in income and increases in income. And actually, Rani, uh, it, what they that those show is it makes a difference to rates of child maltreatment, not just service interactions. And we might want to talk about this. Um, the other thing is that we've been looking at the international literature on poverty aware practice and trying to implement that, uh, particularly Michal Komer Neva's work in Israel, uh, which is very uh, conceptually strong, but also very practical and very based on empirical research. Um, the other reason that we had more of an impact is that um, austerity has really come home to roost. The, the chickens have come home to roost. Uh, you, you can't have 10 years of cutting, of cutting, of cutting, of welfare reforms that have been quite uh, clearly brutal and uh, times have been so focused on most vulnerable in our society, particularly people with disabilities, 
without uh, really developing a, a crisis. And the crisis became really apparent when COVID hit. You know, we there's a phrase we use a lot. It's from a tweet that came out around April 2020, which was, you know, we might be all in the same storm, but we're absolutely not in the same boat. And we saw across our country inequalities that had been hidden absolutely made visible. Who died? Who got sick? Where people locked down, how they lived, what access they had to communication, what access they had to a garden, how able their children were to access education, uh, were all very, very, very different and very unequal. And we became aware across our television screens, particularly at the beginning, as the pictures of the people who had sadly died flashed up of really, really entrenched uh, uh, racialized and gendered inequalities in our society linked to uh, a whole range of factors. Housing crisis that's been 30 years in the making, so we had uh, parents trying to keep their children safe in bed and breakfast and free from infection while they went up and down lifts uh, to try and get to a bit of green garden. We had a really hot period in April, May of 2020 and people were really struggling. Um, so COVID was a game changer and the health inequalities people were really, really uh, able to uh, uh, show the research, the evidence about inequalities, the social gradient and, about, and really move the focus away from, well, it's your choice because you're smoking and drinking too much and it's your choice because you're eating junk food and really, really contextualise things. Uh, and, um, you know, a slogan became apparent, which was that we should build back better or we should build back in a more careful way. However. Um, Okay, uh, we've used those arguments to, uh, to say we can't keep focusing on what happens in the household, we can't keep focusing on what individual mothers do or don't do, and it is always off, often mothers, sadly, it's very gendered. Uh, we need to look at the context in which mothers are living, we need to look at the, uh, who's there for her on a Saturday night when all the professionals are at home, uh, what's it like to be a black mother? Uh, what's it like to be a lone father? Uh, what's the bus service like? So if the kids aren't getting to school on time, really uh, it, walk in her shoes, is that really because she can't be bothered to get up or what's going on? So, I mean, we've done quite a lot of work on the day in a life, a day in the life of a parent, which actually takes people's choices very seriously and hears how they articulate the choices they're making every day. And that we've borrowed a lot of that stuff from Michal's work in Israel. So some of that has become coalesced into something called a social model. I mean, they, there's an interest in a public health model of child protection as well. Not as strong as we would like, but there is an interest in that. We've developed a slightly different approach, which is called a social model. And we have made some links with contextual safeguarding as well, um, which again, we, I haven't got time, I think, to go into today, but I will uh, in the questions. The social model, the key points of the social model, and we've drawn a lot from the work on disability and from uh, mental health, is we don't start from what's going wrong in this individual family and what this parent is doing or not doing. We start from what do we need uh, for children to flourish? And we use Aristotle's notion of flourishing. Um, what do we need to flourish? And we're interested in the capabilities approach, again, all technical. If you're interested, of course, I can let you have some of our publications. And in a nutshell, because I'm aware I'm running out of time, we, there are, we want a better reimagined welfare state. We want, really, really importantly, a welfare state that is focused on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And that is there to offer protection to people when the job market is precarious. That is there with decent, robust, non-shaming welfare system. That is there to uh, really think about housing and what is needed. And basically, at the end of the day, that doesn't, that we want to roll back the way in which the market has been let rip right through our social framework. Uh, it's a big ask. Uh, what we discovered during COVID is our state got bigger during COVID. We spent a lot more, but an awful lot of it got fired to private companies. And uh, what we have recognised, I think, is that when we wrote the book, The Social Model, initially we were rather naive about the about the ability of the state to change and we've had to drill down and really think about the role of international capitalism and the role of financialized capitalism uh, and the way in which states uh, particularly states like ours are outsourcing uh, so much of what they do and their data gathering to private companies finally we do want the state to be bigger but we also want it to be we also want we want 
um, and this is why we called a social model. We have a really in, big interest in community-based approaches, in a bottom-up approach, and crucially, Kate Morris and I have done quite a bit of work with families who had experiences of services. And what we've found time and time again is that there is a great deal of expertise within families around what makes a good system, what they want, and uh, what they would like, and nobody has ever asked them to help to design one. And so we've been interested in and supportive of initiatives that are developing around co-design and co-production. I know they're slippery terms and they can be used and abused. So, um, so the social model is a, a kind of rallying cry as well as a, a framework that we continue to work on and articulate. And we have been developing resources for say supervision, uh, for people to be able to apply a social model to, uh, to uh, supervision with uh, uh, social workers and we've been trying to do poverty aware training where we're getting people to really think about uh, a day in the life of a parent particularly in relation to neglect. I think that's where I'm going to leave it at this point Rani if that's okay. I have no idea whether I've kept a time or not. Oh no, that was brilliant. Thank you so much for all those insights. So much to unpack there. And I'm really glad to meet a mutual rapid pace talker because normally I'm the only one. <laughs> you fit a lot in in that time. So that was great. There's a lot to go over there. Um, and I think what I might do, uh, you know, we might need a series of these chats, Bridget, just to kind of, you know, unpack all those different things. But for today, we'll get Ilan um, and Claudia back in now. And, oh, well, not back in, get them in for the first time. And, and um, just have a bit of a chat about their responses and perspectives in relation to the things that you've said. And, um, then we might have a bit of a discussion. And just to let people know, we don't have to have a hard finish at 4 p.m. So if you can stick around for a few minutes longer, that's okay. Um, but I understand if you need to go. So um, Ilan, I'd go to you first and see if you've got um, a bit of a response to some of the themes that Bridge um, highlighted and some of your perspectives to share. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rani. Uh, let me start off with acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on. I'm also on Gadigal land. Uh, and elders past and present and emerging. I think it's very important, particularly when we're talking about child protection, to acknowledge the stolen generations and the history of child protection in um, Australia. Um, and thank you. I'll go on to thank Brish for a fantastic presentation. Um, it hit so many buttons, really, from an Australian perspective. Uh, a lot of what you said could could have been um, talking about Australia. So there certainly is um, an, an equal, uh, maybe even more of a gradient in Australia. Um, there's um, increasing evidence of that. Um, poverty is not really talked about in terms of child protection in Australia, I think similarly to what you've said. So Australian child protection, the, the system is very, very focused on individual and individual behavior. Um, there's a real focus here on evidence-based practice. And what we mean by evidence is changing people's behavior. That's what the evidence is all about. Um, and just to say that I'm part of a, a study led by my colleague BJ Newton, which, for example, which is looking at restoration from out of home care of Aboriginal children. Um, and what we found is that these structural issues like housing um, and, uh, you know, jobs and access, just access to travel, for example, are far more important in many ways than um, for for those for the parents when you talk to the parents than behaviour change programs and parenting programs. So uh, we we're equally trying to shift the the focus to structural issues within child protection away from um, you know just purely parent behaviour, which is what the system is really focused on now. Um, some of the resonances, for example, uh, there is a, a policy focus in, in Australia on early intervention, as Rani said, but, but it's also early intervention is, in New South Wales, it's called targeted early intervention. And what you mean by targeted is focusing on parents with, who 
struggle with their parenting. So it's not looking at these structural um, issues. Um, but moving on from that, I'd just like to make two other points um, quickly, that, that there are some um, anomalies here that would be interesting to look at. One issue, for example, I just looked at the stats in the last couple of days. Um, child poverty in Australia has actually gone down over the last decade, but paradoxically reports, child protection reports, uh, certainly in New South Wales, have more than doubled in that period of time. So there isn't that link, you know, so just reducing child poverty uh, has not actually made much difference, in fact, the opposite in, in, in terms of reports to the child protection system. So it would be quite interesting to look at what, what are the factors driving that. Um, another interesting issue is uh, going back to COVID, that what happened in Australia with in COVID is that um, because of the government support measures that were brought in, child poverty actually halved for that period of time. Um, and so, and uh, a lot of children in the in the poorest areas, their well-being increased for that period of time. Now all those supports have been withdrawn and child poverty has shut up again post-COVID. So uh, I guess the, the, the message there is that government policy actually does make a difference. Governments during COVID chose to support the poorest people uh, through here, it's called JobKeeper and JobSeeker and uh, free childcare, for example. And yet they chose to pull out pull it away uh, post COVID. So governments can do quite a lot um, to, to support um, people in, in the poorest areas if they want to. So it's a choice that governments make. Um, the other thing I would, I'd like to talk about, and you talked a little bit about this, is some of the research we've done uh, led by my colleague, uh, Sharon Goldfeld, and that is looking at very similar um, uh, disadvantaged communities where you have very different outcomes. So what we did was looked in the same local government area, um, those suburbs where children did worse on the ch uh, Australian child development census, and then those that did, there, there were other very similar areas where children are, were at the top of the census. So they they did, they were in the top uh, decile. Um, and we compared, well, what were the factors within those communities where children, you know, which were very similar from a socioeconomic perspective, but children did much better in one community than another. And what we really found was there was a range of different factors. One of them was the built environment, but a key one was was uh, social capital, that in those uh, communities where children did well, uh, parents were able, there was a place where parents could meet, could support each other, um, and felt bonded to the community. Uh, one of the factors which we weren't even looking for, but which leapt out was the issue of stigma. And in those communities where they felt stigmatized, uh, children tended to do worse than similar communities where there wasn't that stigma. But, but overall, what we found, though, which is quite interesting, is there's a huge diversity in, you know, when you talk about low SES communities, they actually were very, very different, so ranging from some communities where, which were very transient, uh, refugees and other people moving in and then moving out within a couple of years, versus communities where there's entrenched poverty over generations and the same people find it very difficult to move out of that community. So I think, um, I suppose the message there is that when we talk about poverty, we're not, you know, there's a lot of diversity within the concept of poverty and in the concept of a deprived community. And also that there's a lot that communities can actually do even within that context um, to, with government support to support children um, in those communities. So I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that um, and just thinking about some of those issues. Thanks.
Thanks, Alan. I think there's some really good things that we can draw together in the questions and the discussion in a minute. Uh, Claudia, would you like to share some of your thoughts? Sure. I mean, I've been thoroughly enjoying this conversation and I think there's some really key points that just come alive in everyday practice when you're working in child protection. And I think for me, one of the, the main things that really stands out is around how systems compound shame and the stigma that our families actually experience. And isn't it interesting that Alain just mentioned that um, we focus on the choices that individuals make and not that government makes. And that's the system that we're operating in every day. I think one of the best examples, if not the saddest example of how a system can compound shame is when families who are in need and engaged in the child protection system and wanting to actively engage, um, actively engage with um, daycare have to actually write a letter and have their practitioner write a letter that says their children are at risk so that they can access a special childcare benefit to make childcare affordable. I mean, here are parents who are trying their best, who have been asked to take their children to daycare, and we actually make them very shameful in the experience of engaging in trying to improve their circumstances. To me, in a country that we live in, that's fairly outrageous that we make that the benchmark for people to be able to access what should be universal. I think some of the other things that um, Professor Featherstone has spoken about in um, activities of daily living that we see in our families and how we actually then judge that is um, also one of the things we need to focus on. I think about in Sydney recently, it has been raining and it feels like it's never ending raining. And I'm a really quite a, you know, is, you know, um, functioning person most days. And when it's raining, getting on the bus seems too hard. I want to get in my own car. Yet we're asking mums generally who have multiple children to get on the bus in the rain, get to three different appointments. One of them's probably a counselling appointment that they've been able to maybe not afford under the mental health plan because there's a gap there. Um, there's no childcare that they're actually allowed to put their children in. Then they have to get to Centrelink to say, yes, I've been doing what I've been needing to do to get my income support. And then hopefully they'll get on the bus again with their children to get to housing to talk about the issues that they're experiencing in their houses and if the parent doesn't do that we then um, look at that as they're not actually meeting um, the requirements to keep their children safe how do we expect people to be able to do that when there is such inequality in the way that we all operate I think one of the other things particularly around the social capital that um, Alan was talking about was how we make that also really inaccessible for people. Um, Professor Featherstone mentioned about who's gonna be there on a Saturday night to look after your children. And often that's probably people from school or the soccer club. But we know here in um, Australia, even engaging in sporting activities is extraordinarily expensive and unaffordable for people. So, you know, you can have some government support in assisting you with that, but it's gonna buy you half a soccer boot. And then you're in the uniform that doesn't quite match, which enhances the stigmatization, which therefore is going to limit your ability to socially connect with people and have somebody there with you on a Saturday night. And again, how does that impact on the safety of children? But we see that through that individual lens rather than the systemic lens that continues to burden the families within the system. For us here at the Benevolent Society, the way that we try to address some of that is through the holistic um, approach. So in our Queensland, we have in our Queensland services, we have early years places. They're sort of integrated service delivery models, soft entry points for families that may be coming in contact with the child protection system or who are in contact with the child protection system. And this allows them to get um, quite a few services, domestic violence services, financial counselling services, basic healthcare services and playgroup services. So all of these things help those families really um, engage in a meaningful, less stigmatising environment so that we can continue to work with them to hopefully address some of those other concerns that are coming up. I think there might be some networking connection issues here. So potentially I'll pause there, Rani, because it might be helpful for the conversation. Is it okay? Oh, my computer's saying otherwise. Okay, well, this is great. <laughs> I'll keep going. I love it. I love the fact that we're talking about um, a social model about how we actually help people flourish and actually talking to the people that we want to flourish to find out from them. Um, at the Benevolent Society, we also use a lovely measure called the most significant change question. And, you know, often as social workers and practitioners, we think we're doing beautiful therapeutic work and how well we're doing with attachment and the parenting styles and teaching um, new skills and capabilities. And, and we are absolutely doing that. 
But when we asked a young person who we'd been involved with what had been the most significant change since we had been involved with him and his family, he said to us, I've got a bedroom door. And that, I think, speaks volumes to the work that everybody is doing in the system. Housing um, under-resourced and, and we can continue to see struggles with people trying to get accessible housing, trying to get housing at the right time, trying to get housing so they can have their children returned into care. And we hear these ongoing everyday basic needs conversations. And we know as practitioners that one of the best ways to engage families who are resistant to engaging is what we used to say is dangling the carrot, which is basically about offering um, solutions to some of their basic needs. Might be a transport solution, might be helping with an electricity bill, might be helping fill in the housing form. And so rather than us now still thinking about that as a carrot for engagement, we actually need to see that within the context of the impact it's having on keeping children safe. So, I mean, I'm very excited by all these conversations about how do we bring this holistic view into understanding uh, what's happening in individual families, but actually understanding that this is a systems issue, not an individual issue. Absolutely. Um, what a great wrap up there, Claudia. So great to hear all the different you know, things that are happening on the ground and how it's actually being seen and that fact that you know this all just gives more sort of inspiration and impetus for us all to act you know but what I'm hearing from all of you is that it is a systems response we need there are lots of different siloed systems we know that children's um, safety and well-being is at risk at the center of this families are put in you know untenable situations like you're saying Claudia with the you know attending multiple appointments and um, then being punitively punished if they're not um, able to meet those requirements. So what have you seen, um, I suppose, Bridge, um, in particular with you? I think you mentioned that there was a example in Northern Ireland um, that um, came out of your um, in welfare and equality study right in the beginning, where there was, um, you know, some, uh, like a difference between what you saw in the other, um, you know, areas, where, you know, so there was a bit more of a positive story to share. So I'm just, you know, interested in hearing from Ilan and yourself um, and from Claudia about, what you think can actually bring these systems together rather than like we can see the problem what's the solution here you want me to speak yeah yeah, yeah okay and um, yeah i i wanted um i was going to talk about northern ireland in response to elan's comments about differences and complexity and kind of moving away from big statements about deprivation because um northern ireland is the most deprived part of the uk it's actually also pretty equal. You don't have a Kensington and Chelsea or a kind of London, you know, some of these really posh bits of London in uh, Northern Ireland. It's it's relatively flat, but it's very deprived, very deprived. And yes, we found now this. You may say this isn't, and I mean it isn't. It's only one measure. But what we found were the rates of children coming into care were lower, much lower than particularly Scotland. Scotland's were very high. And so we did get a bit of additional money to go back and do uh, a case study in Northern Ireland and to look at what might be going on. Now, we're wary of kind of extrapolating. It wasn't a big study. And, you know, we're wary of extrapolating because, you know, and I, I say this as an Irish person, I would never hold up Northern Ireland as an example of how to of, of a good society. In many ways, it's profoundly dysfunctional and very conflict ridden tragically, tragically, and is going through terrible times at the minute uh, as a result of the Brexit uh, um, uh, stuff. Uh, but, but within Northern Ireland, what we did find were very, very strong communities. Going back to your point, Ilan, uh, we found, you know, you did have very strong commitment to kinship. You had very strong uh, ties between people and at a policy level you had a very strong commitment to family support and you had an integration of family support into the fabric of services you had a very um he's just left sadly but a very good chief social worker really good chief social worker who really heard the messages of our research and was really interested in uh, integrating an anti-poverty practice framework into their family health work so you had a number of things going on in northern ireland um 
but some of that was subsequent to our actual findings. So it, you know, the, the stuff about the community cohesion. Ironically, it's a divided society, but communities look after each other and they look after their children. And there's a strong tradition of grandmothers, uh, particularly in some parts. So th that's, I mean, again, I'm not extra. I'm not. I'm being careful about it. We've written an article on it if you're interested. Um, but I would always be, you know, there's a lot more drilling down to do. And you know what's being hidden under those figures as well. You know, are all our kids always? Like to be kept at home within those extended families you know that they're open questions they're normative questions so that so yeah so um i personally think that um and again i think there's a lot more work to be done i think social capital is really important and i think what we found uh we found in, didn't we, uh, the, our systems can actually disrupt and rupture social capital. What we found in the early days, particularly of COVID, for young people, many of them were telling us that it was actually, many of the kids who were in foster care were saying, it's a real relief. I don't have to do all these things. I don't have to go to these appointments. And certainly I don't have to go to school. I mean, it is a tragedy how school has become a really big source of anxiety for many of our young, vulnerable young people. And again, that's about policy choices. We have a really, really uh, strong exam oriented testing focus and it's a very it's a very shaming system for a lot of kids um so uh, particularly one of the kids and so what we found in, in covid was that people weren't having to get on the bus and go to multiple appointments and they were actually able to have a break and you know uh, many of them reported increased well-being so our role in rupturing people's everyday lives and rupturing their strengths acknowledged Okay, I had some other points I wanted to make. Yeah, going back to your point, uh, Ilan, earlier on about uh, not just about differences in deprivation, but also just differences and that we need to, you know, have a more nuanced lens. We are finding actually, you know, that some very deprived areas or some very deprived local authorities are turning things around really well in the UK. So it is a combination of things and they are, you know, practice models do difference i'm really keen on restorative approaches to um top protection and again learned a lot from australia and new zealand on work like that i you know i think i live near it and i do a lot of work with them i think places like leeds are really trying to make a difference they have a, an anti-poverty framework they have um a strong commitment to thinking outside the box and you know going back to the point of intergenerational trauma and the role we play in intergenerational trauma we have become very aware, and again, we've look, looked and learned from you, uh, and I've certainly done a lot of uh, listening and thinking about what's happened to First Nation and Aboriginal peoples. Um, we have generations of people who've had their children removed for whom we take and then we take their children away. So uh, current Broadhurst's work and current parents and current uh, removals has really hit uh, home to us and has made us really think about, because often those children you know, I was at a conference not too long ago where a young woman stood up and said, I was taken into care because I was being emotionally abused by mother. I'm 22 years of age. I've just had my child taken away for emotional abuse. Who, who's helped me break that cycle? You know, so I think there is a kind of humility and reflexivity around, um, around our interventions that we really need to embrace. And um, yeah. So I don't know, that's a bit of a jumble, but yeah, I think Northern Ireland is really interesting. I think you're right, Karen. We hear all the time, we've got a phrase, a washing machine would really help. You know, we, 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 we hear all the time from people. Oh, and one thing I really wanted to say to you, uh, sorry, Claudia, I don't know why I said sorry, Claudia, it, um, we have a group here in, uh, near, in Huddersfield of mothers, it's been going for a long time, uh, of mothers who, uh, whose children have been removed. Um, so mothers living apart from their children. And they do a lot of training for adoptive parents around the importance of, you know, letterbox and of uh, kind of keeping in touch and all that kind of thing. And they often comment on how beautiful the training facilities are for foster parents, how good quality of biscuits is, and contrast that with what their contact arrangements were like and the dismal kind of situations they were often in as they said goodbye to their children who were being adopted. So I think mm -hmm. our, our buildings even can communicate messages. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Bridge, for all of that. Um, I think that, yeah, what we're saying about social capital and the importance of relationships and the connections is just vital to changing things if we're not just going to look at this professionalisation and service response 
way of looking at the well-being of children and their safety. Um, and in during COVID, we did see this kind of, you know, resurgence of community vibe. People were, you know, hanging out in parks and doing the letter drops and knocking, you know, and checking in that people had their groceries. Obviously, we all had our masks on. We're trying not to talk to each other, social distancing, but actually kind of promoted some pro-social behaviours around connecting people. But as soon as that stopped, everyone's kind of gone back to their normal. And it is really hard, particularly for people who live in apartments and, um, you know, those sorts of, like you were talking about building structures, uh, to actually really connect. There's so much research around um, social isolation as well, which obviously all of these issues impact and go to Ilan's point of there's so much nuance in talking about deprivation um, or poverty. It's not just, you know, one type of um, community or family. Um, so Ilan, I'll just invite you in on the question that I had put to Bridge, which was, um, you know, what are those differences that you're seeing, um, you know, in those co communities that you're talking about in the study uh, that Sharon Goldfeld led and that we will share a link yeah. to? Um, yeah, you said that there was, um, you know, social uh, cohesion was a big part of it and so was the stigma. Could you just elaborate a little bit of on what that social cohesion or social capital looked like, the bonded part? Or, and built environment was really interesting, if you could just give us a sense of why that made a difference. Um, okay, I'll start off with the built environment. It, we, we did, I mean, it's interesting what Bridge was saying about COVID in the UK, because what we found was that um, people who had their own house and own little garden, even if that that they um, did a lot better than in communities where there were high rises, um, even with the, at the same socioeconomic status. Um, so the the type of housing that people had um, was you know, made, made a big difference. And, and I think it was more, not only the housing bit of it, but the fact that in those communities, people communicated more than in high rise situations. So it was the, the socials kind of interacted with the, the housing, but also mm -hmm. things like walkability, uh, you know, whether people could felt that they could walk around their communities, whether they felt that there was somewhere in their communities that they could go to to meet other people. So the physical environment uh, made quite a lot of, of difference. And you can't really separate these because the, so, the social capital um, was also linked to, to the physical environment as well. So for example, in some communities, um, the pe people had to access resources within the community because there wasn't transport outside. In other communities, people could access um, services or resources outside because there was easier transport, uh, and that made a difference to to children. Um, so, but but I think the the, the big picture point that I was making was that um, where where you've got a sense of community, a sense of people working together within the community, um, then that seemed to be a, uh, and also another domain which I didn't talk about before, which was governance. So people felt that um, they had a stake in decisions about their community. Um, those were the communities where children tended to do better. Um, and so it's, it's a mixture of services working together, people feeling a stake in the community, people having some kind of say over um, yep. the community's future that uh, could make a difference. And, you know, what we didn't look at, and obviously that's the next step, is to say, well, what can you do about it? Uh, it's one thing to compare one community to another. It's another to try and actually turn one community into some, something mm -hmm. different. So that's the, would be the next, um, the, the next stage of the research or the next intervention. So there are quite a lot of um, what I call place-based initiatives in Australia. Uh, they haven't been very well researched. So that's the, that's another piece of research that could be done. But just one thing, just while I'm on research, one advantage we do have actually in Australia is that we now have quite a lot of very extensive linked data sets that we can mm. use. Um, so that you can answer some of the questions that Brige raised. 
um, and they have done some work both in New South Wales, which I'm part of, but also in other states where you can actually say, well, of those children that come into care or, in, or um, have contact with child protection system, what was the history of their parents? Were their parents working? Um, were they in contact with the criminal justice system, the mental health system, etc.? So we're beginning to do quite a lot of research in that kind of area. And then the next Bit of that as well is to say well what what makes a difference in those circumstances and um that's fantastic to hear alan also in terms of what you raised was um you know the early intervention being too late a point anyway so we need to map the data we need to understand better how children and families um you know what's the trajectory what are those key critical points at which we can intervene and what are those factors that make a difference. Um, and as many of you might know, there's a child maltreatment study coming out next year as well, um, which will really look at the numbers of, um, you know, it's retrospective data, but it is going to be significantly important to this conversation. And they've gathered a lot of data about circumstances of those families as well to say when was this, um, you know, abuse um, yeah. experience. Etc. So it'll, there's there's a lot of research to be done at the same time as the practice. So Claudia, how do you see? Um, sorry, everyone. I know it's four o'clock. So if you need to go, you're welcome to step off. But we'd love you to stay for at least maybe five or ten more minutes, um, and just to cover two um, critical points. So Claudia, if you have a quick thought in terms of what um, Bridge and um, Ilan were saying about a sense of community being really important in making a difference, that social capital, um, have you seen that in your work? Well, I mean, I think I think I see that every day as a human about this desire to belong, right? And um, families and people engaged in the child protection system are actually no different. So I, I think how do we create a, a sense of belonging where people don't feel shame and stigmatisation? How do we do that as a whole community? How do we stop um, over-professionalising care? How is it that um, service systems and individual caseworkers are where um, many of the families have their biggest care? Connection. How do we change our assessments and our work as social workers to work out how we embed families within communities? How do we help them create their own social connections, be it with the soccer group, with church, with school, whatever that might be? Because we, we all want somewhere to belong and we all want to be somewhere where people accept us for who we are um, and all of the faults and the great things that we bring to this situation and, and families engaged in child protection are no different to the rest of us. So for me, it's around how do we continue to take that mindset? They definitely have systemic structures that you know make that much more difficult. So how do we use the systems to create some of that in a in a more fruitful way but what we're hoping for for child protection families should be what we're hoping for for our own families and where we yeah. start to differentiate differentiate that in many ways is where I think we get in trouble yeah. mm. uh, that's a really great point and it's very much about how do you enable those communities to come together yeah. in that way you know, um, where there's where that there's that sense of the over professionalization and too many services. How do you actually build that social capital again? But like you said, it's not um, a, a helpful uh, frame to be differentiating in that way and to actually be talking about changing the conversation. So this mm -hmm. um, takes me back to Bridges point about how you said um, when you first started this work, you did get a lot of resistance from people talking about poverty and deprivation in relation to child protection. Um, um, how did you manage to bring people along or what do you think were the key factors that made you know, were helpful in changing that conversation and you know, crucially what we've been talking about a lot today is the bottom-up approach so do you have any sense of how families themselves felt about this conversation because professionals were clearly balking at the idea I don't want to you know shame families and link this but obviously families who are living in um, you know these areas know what the reality of the situation is and how so what was there did you have um, any you know uh, chance to kind of explore that with the families themselves so if you can share bridge okay yeah sure uh yeah just because i have a terrible memory as i've already demonstrated on the last point yeah we have worked quite closely with organizations like atd fourth world which is an international organization uh, of parents living in poverty and they've been doing a lot of work in england around child protection and training social workers around child protection and you know uh, the points you've been making claudia are are really and andy elan 
there is something we've lost, which is about being really practical about like, what is it like in every day? What's the bus service like? Is there a library? Is there a park? That kind of intensely practical. And of course, engaging with parents, which is, this is their bed and bread and butter. And they remind you all the time of, I mean, Anna, if Anna Gupta was here, my colleague Anna Gupta, she has some amazing, she's done a lot of work with ATD Fourth World because Royal Hallway have had a kind of a formal relationship with this organization as well over the years. And um, you know, she has stories about, you know, how difficult it is uh, for kids to get uh, their bus passes if you don't have a computer, you know, and the whole thing about like, it's a vicious circle starts with, you haven't access to the internet, you can't get this, you can't afford that, and you end up not being able to go to school you know, because you can't get a bus pass, that kind of thing. So, so we did, we have talked to parents quite a lot. Uh, we've been told off sometimes about uh, the way we've talked about stuff. It's, you're right, Ronnie, you know, when you were saying about can, these conversations can be really tricky and difficult. And, you know, we've been challenged about, you know, what do we know about it, all that kind of thing. But it's what our, our commitment has been to talking to families all the way through. In terms of impact, um, I, I'm, yeah, in, we, I'm very interested in, although I, yeah, I'm very interested in framing theory and I'm very interested in communication and how you tell stories. And rather than, although I have done this today, rather than coming out with the facts and figures, actually telling a story about who you are, what you want to be, and connecting in with what you say, Claudia, about people's dreams and aspirations. And professionals, you know, when you engage in respectful dialogue with professionals, they, they don't want to be people who are shaming families. That's the last thing they want to be. So I, I've spent a lot of time, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how we talk to people, how we listen to them, how we engage in conversations. I'm not saying we've done it brilliantly and we've done it, but we've done it better. We've had champions as well in local authorities. You know, we did a lot of work in one local authority because the senior manager was really committed to it. So we did loads of training, brought up loads of issues around culture. You know, people would say things just like, well, you know, she's always running out of milk, but her, and so we have to go around with milk, but she always has her nails done. So you have to talk then about, or you have to ask questions about like, what's, you know, people, this is heresy sometimes to say to workers, but we aren't just mothers, you know, we aren't just grandmothers, we are women with dreams and hopes and all those things. So all those kind of conversations. Um, yeah, so in terms of impact, we've worked hard on it. Uh, I think that, I think it's a combination though, um, George Lakoff says, you know, that telling stories without a really strong ethical commitment, the remote, most robust evidence, mm -hmm. that is unethical. So we have done our best to produce the best evidence we can in terms of our data. We've, you know, we've shown how we've done our workings out. We've tried to be as transparent as possible about our methodologies. And um, that is different from evidence-based practice, uh, as you were talking about, Alan. It's about the integrity of the data as far as we can make it. And then within that, using the data to help and explore different ways of thinking. I do think there is, a, we're trying to do a lot of data linkage uh, in the UK. Um, and I know people who are involved in a whole range of projects about it. Of course, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but we do have to be careful about the democratization project in relation to this. We do have to be careful about who's using what data. And again, with the uh, growth in kind of privatization of a lot of our government services, what, what's our data being used for and what's the data of people being used for in terms of targeting. And um, I can't quite remember her name now, but there's an amazing American woman who's written a lot on this and how, how data gathering can entrench racial biases. And yeah, anyway, mm -hmm. we, but we, we do need to. It is disgraceful that we don't know so many things about the parents from whom we're taking children away. Bridge, while you're on a roll, I just want to ask you one other question, and then I know we need to start wrapping up, so I'll ask Ilan and Claudia for their final thoughts in a minute. But um, I know in a previous conversation with you that we had offline, you did mention something that was really interesting, and I just want you to share a quick thought about that, which was doing more joined up work or breaking down these silos of practice and, you know, different um, areas isn't just about professionals having more meetings. Um, and I thought that was really interesting, um, because often when you think about, you know, the way governments or you know, funders, the people, you know, the powers that be, think about joined up work. They do think about, oh, let's get everyone in the room again and let's have another round table or another, you know, big summit or whatever. So what did you mean by that? And if you've got any good ideas about how to do this better, I think you meant more ground up. So please. Yeah. Yeah. It's really an issue in our current research on domestic abuse. We've just, um, Nuffield again, very kindly have given us a new, uh, and some money to do, uh, to you, to look at, um, 
domestic abuse from an inequalities perspective and particularly from an intersectionality perspective and again we're doing a little bit of the same thing where we're doing really really digging down into the data what do people mean when they talk about domestic abuse they say domestic abuse referrals anyway sorry but i just wanted to get that in because <laughs> my latest passion but um one of the things we did during the pandemic online we had a, what we called what was called a change project with over 30 agencies who were committed to thinking and responding differently in relation to domestic abuse and uh, it was a really interesting project and all the outputs from it are online and they're free to access and i can send a link but one of the things they did the professionals and these were people who were really thinking about the fact that they did that they were you know blaming mothers that they were expecting mothers to protect children that they weren't engaging men they were really committed to thinking differently about domestic abuse but one of the obvious things that happened every time was a referral came in and the default position even from the most progressive people was we have a meeting with the professionals we have a multi-agency meeting and what we wanted to say was well have you talked to the man and woman about what's going on and crucially actually what we found was that the conversations with the families were deeply impoverished there was no conversation with the man often if he was the perpetrator mm. and, you know he was told mm. to separate and go um, and the mother it was a very performative you must protect your children you're exposing them to um abuse and um, and so they were having these intense conversations with each other about well what's known and do the kids go to school uh, and that was their default position every time even the most progressive ones it was we must um we must talk to each other and actually we we're saying uh no your first protocol is to talk to the people involved and have proper conversations with them yeah I mean, this is very difficult to agency work because I've just read too many reviews. We've had the, all these child deaths in this country. And you said mm. I was very forthright, Ronnie. I'm just going to show how forthright yeah. I am now. <laughs> but we've had, we get all, we've just had two very, very, very tragic deaths in this country. Um, and in both cases, both children were surrounded by relatives, grandparents in particular, who were expressing concern constantly and members of the community were expressing concern constantly about the their ch these children and what was the recommendation from the panel more multi-agency working and down the road in leeds you have very successful family group conferencing you and it's not just in leeds you have very successful family group conferencing working um to support families in just those kind of circumstances so it just mm. bewilders me thank you um ilan and claudia a uh, tough act to follow, but do you have a final thought you'd like to share with the audience, um, you know, in terms of wrapping up your thinking around these things or, you know, a key thing, I guess, that is that people can take forward in their work? Like, what do we want to be doing um, or, you know, focusing on in order to make a difference to this issue? Um, well, I'll quickly like talk. Uh, I, th I think one area, though, I mean, Bridge, you, you criticised the UK, but Australia is really behind the UK in this area, is um, actually talking to parents, talking to to children in particular in child protection. Um, I mean, there's a new buzzword, which is co-design. Um, and people keep on talking about co-design, but you don't really see it very much at all in child protection, certainly in Australia. And I, and I think that that is one, um, one you know, and quite a lot of research that we've done of children in care, for example, the, the children's actual voices are just not heard and mm. the parents, the birth parents are not heard either. I mean, somebody might talk to them, but they're not actually heard in terms of decision making. I think that mm. that um, would make a huge difference, you know, over and above all these community things, which I think is important. So that would be the other one is communities getting much more involved in protecting um, children within the community and decision-making around. And, and there's quite a lot of work in the Aboriginal communities now of taking much more control over the child protection system um, in the Aboriginal communities. So I think if we allow that to, to go forward, we'll start making a difference. Thanks, Alain. Claudia? 
Uh, look, just building on, I think, definitely having to listen to the voice of the people that we're working with. And the other thing I would say is when you're meeting families or parents for the first time, um, before passing judgment on their actions and their behaviours, understanding what systems they're belonging to and the barriers that some of those systems might be putting in place for them to be able to achieve the things that we're asking of them. So really just taking that systems view to the individual situation is something that I would love us all to be able to do regardless of the roles we're in. Oh, that's a fantastic one that often is overlooked. You know, there's systems and then there's individual work. It's like, how do you bring that into the individual work you're doing? What are those barriers um, and opportunities? So fantastic. And Ilan, to your point, it is so important to hear the voices of children and their lived experience. And we do have this video to share from um, Professor Sharon Bessel and her team who've done a great, um, you know, sort of research project, really hearing deeply from children about their experiences of poverty. And, you know, in this discussion today, we have come up with those key points around, you know, obviously having access to material basics, but what children also said was, um, missing out on participating in certain things. And Claudia, you really went to that around, you know, buying half a soccer boot with the with the voucher, because it's true. It's like, there's such a barrier to actual participation and children feel it deeply because everyone else is doing these things. They're going to the birthday parties and they're taking a present, but I can't, you know, that stuff. Um, and then lastly, relationships and relationships getting disrupted by things like, you know, a parent losing a job and the stress that puts on the adult, then putting the strain on the relationship with the child, which isn't about the parent not being a loving parent, but about the stresses that we can put on families. And that's where the context in which families live and the impacts on child abuse and neglect need to be seen much more broadly so that we can find those points for prevention much earlier, support those families before those issues become entrenched or escalate. So thank you all so much for your contributions today. It's been a fantastic discussion. I think Bridge, we're definitely gonna have to invite you back again because <laughs> there's just so much more to unpack um, and so much more um, to kind of really understand. I think there's something that we didn't get to today, but I will kind of, um, probably share it in the email that we'll send to all of you that um, participated today, but also anyone who has registered, which is about poverty proofing um, things. And I think, you know, in the UK, they've been doing this around the school day, for example, and looking at how it might impact um, a child's experience at school. So I think, you know, there's some really interesting things we can pick up on at another date. Um, but, um, you know, I should have booked this for three hours. So thank you again um, for your lovely, you know, contributions and your important ideas about what we can do. Um, we will be sharing this recording as well. And Bridge, thank you so much for getting up so early as well. Um, and thank you all for your time for, you know, sending through questions and discussion themes. So I did kind of theme them up in the questions that I asked um, of the panelists. And um, yeah, so that's all we have time for. I'm going to play the video, but I just want to say this is not the end of the conversation. I hope you'll take some of what we've learnt today forward in your work and have a chat to colleagues about it as well. Um, there's a short survey that'll pop up when you close this webinar. Um, so please um, do complete that survey for us so that we know what you liked and what you might want to see in the future. And um, finally, please um, have a look at the video and really, you know, let's listen to the children, let's listen to what they have to say and join the call to halve child poverty by 2030 by going to the Anti-Poverty Week website. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks.